Chapter 3 The Mead Hall Many miles north of Ten Towns, across the trackless tundra to the northernmost edge of the land in all of the realms, the frosts of winter had already hardened the ground in a white tipped glaze. There were no mountains or trees to block the cold bite of the relentless eastern wind, carrying the frosty air from the ragged glacier. The great bergs of the sea of moving ice drifted slowly past, the wind howling off their high riding tips in a grim reminder of the coming season. And yet the nomadic tribes who summered there with the reindeer had not journeyed with the herd's migration southwest along the coast to the more hospitable sea on the south side of the peninsula. The unwavering flatness of the horizon was broken in one small corner by a solitary encampment, the largest gathering of the barbarians this far north in more than a century. To accommodate the leaders of the respective tribes, several deerskin tents had been laid out in a circular pattern, each encompassed in its own ring of campfires. In the center of this circle, a huge deerskinned hall had been constructed, designed to hold every warrior of the tribes. The tribesmen called it Hangarot, the Mead Hall. And to the northern barbarians, this was a place of reverence, where food and drink were shared in toast to Tempest, the god of battle. The fires outside the hall burned low this night, for King Hiefstag and the tribe of the Elk, the last to arrive, were expected in the camp before Monset. All of the barbarians already in the encampment had assembled in Hangarot and begun the pre-council festivities. Great flagons of mead dotted every table, and good-natured contests of strength sprang up with growing frequency. Though the tribes often warred with each other, in Hangarot all differences were put aside. King Bjorg, a robust man with tousled blonde locks, a beard fading to white, and lines of experience etched deeply into his tanned face, stood solemnly at the head of the table. Representing his people, he stood tall and straight, his wide shoulders proudly squared. The barbarians of Icewind Dale stood a full head and more above the average inhabitants of Ten Towns sprouting as though to take advantage of the wide and roomy expanses of the empty tundra. They were indeed much akin to their land. Like the ground they roamed over, their often bearded faces were browned from the sun and cracked by the constant wind, giving them a leathery toughened appearance, a foreboding expressionless mask that did not welcome outsiders. They despised the people of Ten Towns, whom they considered weak wealth chasers possessed of no spiritual value whatsoever. Yet one of those wealth chasers stood among them now in their most revered hall of meetings. At Bjorg's side was de Bernazon, the dark-haired southerner, the only man in the room who was not born and bred of the barbarian tribes. The mousy de Bernazon kept his shoulders defensively hunched as he glanced nervously about the hall. He was well aware that the barbarians were not overly fond of outsiders, and that any of them, even the youngest attendant, could break him in half with a casual flick of his huge hands. Hold steady, Bjorg constructed the southerner. Tonight you hoist mead flagons with the tribe of the wolf. If they sense your fear... He left the rest unspoken, but de Bernazon knew well how the barbarians dealt with weakness. The small man took a steadying deep breath and straightened his shoulders. Yet Bjorg too was nervous. King Hiefstag was his primary rival on the tundra, commanding a force as dedicated, disciplined, and numerous as his own. Unlike the customary barbarian raids, Bjorg's plan called for the total conquest of ten towns, enslaving the surviving fishermen and living well off the wealth they had harvested from the lakes. Bjorg saw an opportunity for his people to abandon their precarious nomadic existence and find a measure of luxury they had never known. Everything now hinged on the ascent of Hishtag, a brutal king interested only in personal glory and triumphant plunder. Even if the victory over Ten Towns was achieved, Bjorg knew that he would eventually have to deal with his rival, who would not easily abandon the fervent bloodlust that had put him in power. That was a bridge the king of the tribe of the wolf would have to cross later. The primary issue now was the initial conquest, and if Hiefstag refused to go along, the lesser tribes would split in their alliances among the two. War might be joined as early as the next morning. This would prove devastating to all their people, for even the barbarians who survived the initial battles would be in for a brutal struggle against winter. The reindeer had long since departed for the southern pastures, and the caves along the route had not been stocked in preparation. Hiefstag was a cunning leader. He knew that at this late date, the tribes were committed to following the initial plan, but Bjorg wondered what terms his rival would impose. Bjorg took comfort in the fact that no major conflicts had broken out among the assembled tribes 
and this night, when they all met in the common hall, the atmosphere was brotherly and jovial, with every beard in Hangarot lathered in foam. Bjorg's gamble had been that the tribes could be united by a common enemy and the promise of continued prosperity. All had gone well, so far, but the brute Heefstog remained the key to it all. The heavy boots of Heefstog's column shook the ground beneath their determined march. The huge, one-eyed king himself led the procession, his great swinging strides indicative of the nomads of the tundra. Intrigued by Bjorg's proposal and wary of winter's early onset, the rugged king had chosen to march straight through the cold nights, stopping only for short periods of food and rest. Though primarily known for his ferocious proficiency in battle, Heefstog was a leader who carefully weighed his every move. The impressive march would add to the initial respect given his people by the warriors of the other tribes, and Heefstag was quick to pounce on any advantage he could get. Not that he expected any trouble at Hengarot, he held Bjorg in high respect. Twice before he had met the king of the tribe of the wolf on the field of honor with no victory to show for it. If Bjorg's plan was as promising as it initially seemed, Heefstag would go along, insisting only on an equal share in the leadership with the blonde king. He didn't care for the notion that the tribesmen, once they conquered the towns, could end their nomadic lifestyle and be contented with a new life trading knucklehead trout, but he was willing to allow Bjorg his fantasies if they delivered to him the thrill of battle and easy victory. Let the plunder be taken and warmth secured for the long winter before he changed the original agreement and redistributed the booty. When the lights of the campfires came into view, the column quickened its pace. Sing, my proud warriors, Heefstag commanded. Sing hearty and strong. Let those gathered tremble at the approach of the tribe of the elk. Bjorg had an ear cocked for the sound of Heefstag's arrival. Knowing well the tactics of his rival, he was not surprised in the least when the first notes of the Song of Tempest rolled in from the night. The blonde king reacted at once, leaping onto a table and calling silence to the gathering. Hawken, men of the north, he cried. Behold the challenge of the song! Hengarat immediately burst into commotion as the men dashed from their seats and scrambled to join the assembling groups of their respective tribes. Every voice was lifted in the common refrain to the god of battle, singing of deeds of valor and of glorious deaths on the field of honor. This verse was taught to every barbarian boy from the time he could speak his first words, for the song of Tempus was actually considered a measure of tribe strength. The only variances in the word from tribe to tribe was the refrain that identified the singers. Here the warriors sang at crescendo pitch, for the challenge of the song was to determine whose call to the god of battle was most clearly heard by Tempus. Heefstag led his men right up to the entrance of Hengarat. Inside the hall, the calls of the tribe of the wolf were obviously drowning out the others, but Heefstag's warriors matched the strength of Bjorg's men. One by one, the lesser tribes fell silent under the dominance of the wolf and the elk. The challenge dragged on between the two remaining tribes for many more minutes, neither willing to relinquish superiority in the eyes of their deity. Inside the mead hall, men of the beaten tribes nervously put their hands to their weapons. More than one war had erupted on the plains because the challenge of the song could determine no clear winner. Finally, the flap of the tent opened, admitting Heefstag's standard bearer, a youth tall and proud with observing eyes that carefully weighed everything about him and belied his age. He put a whalebone horn to his lips and blew a clear note. Simultaneously, according to tradition, both tribes stopped their singing. The standard bearer walked across the room toward the host king, his eyes never blinking or turning away from Bjork's imposing visage. Though Bjork could see that the youth marked the expressions that were upon him, Heefstag had chosen his herald well, Bjork thought. Good King Bjork, the standard bearer began, when all commotion had ceased and other assembled kings. The tribe of the elk asks leave to enter Hangarat and share mead with you, that we might join together and toast to Tempus. Bjorg studied the herald a bit longer, testing to see if he could shake the youth's composure with an unexpected delay. But the herald did not blink or turn aside his penetrating stare, and the set of his jaw remained firm and confident. Granted, answered Bjorg, impressed, and well met. Then he mumbled under his breath, A pity that Heefstag is not possessed of your patience. I announce Heefstag, king of the tribe of the elk, the herald cried out in a clear voice. Son of Rothhoof the strong, son of Angar the brave, thrice killer of the great bear, 
twice conqueror of Tourmaline to the south, who slew Rag Donig, king of the tribe of the bear, in a single combat in a single stroke. This drawing uneasy shuffles from the tribe of the bear, and especially their king, Halfdane, son of Rag Donig. The herald went on for many minutes, listing every deed, every honor, every title accumulated by Hiefstag during his long and illustrious career. As the challenge of the song was competition between the tribes, the listing of titles and feats was a personal competition between men, especially kings whose valor and strength reflected directly upon their warriors. Bjorg had dreaded this moment, for his rival's list exceeded even his own. He knew that one of the reasons Hiefstag had arrived last was so that his list could be presented to all in attendance. Menu had heard Bjorg's own herald and private audience upon their arrival days before. It was the advantage of a host king to have his list read to every tribe in attendance, while the heralds of visiting kings would only speak to the tribes present upon their immediate arrival. By coming in last, and at a time when all of the other tribes would be assembled together, Hishtag had erased that advantage. At length, the standard bearer finished and returned across the hall to open the tent flap for his king. Hishtag strode confidently across Hangarot to face Bjorg. If men were impressed with Hishtag's list of valor, they were certainly not disappointed by his appearance. The red-bearded king was nearly seven feet tall, with a barrel-shaped girth that dwarfed even Bjorg's, and Hiefstag wore his battle scars proudly. One of his eyes had been torn out by the antlers of a reindeer, and his left hand was helplessly crumpled from a fight with a polar bear. The king of the tribe of the elk had seen more battles than any man on the tundra, and by all appearances he was ready and anxious to fight in many more. The two kings eyed each other sternly, neither blinking or diverting his glance for even a moment. The wolf or the elk? Hiefstag asked at length, the proper question after an undecided challenge of the song. Bjorg was careful to give the appropriate response. Well met and well fought, he said. Let the keen ears of Tempest alone decide, though the god himself will be hard-pressed to make such a choice. With the formalities properly carried out, the tension eased from Hiefstag's face. He smiled broadly at his rival. Well met, Bjorg, king of the tribe of the wolf. It does me well to face you and not see my own blood staining the tip of your deadly spear. Hiefstag's friendly words caught Bjorg by surprise. He couldn't have hoped for a better start to the war council. He returned a compliment with equal fervor. Nor to duck the sure cut of your cruel axe. The smile abruptly left Hiefstag's face when he took notice of the dark-haired man at Bjorg's side. What right, by valor or by blood, does this weakling southerner have in the mead hall of Tempos? The red-bearded king demanded. His place is with his own, or with a woman at best. Hold to faith, Hiefstag, Bjorg explained. This is de Bernazan, a man of great import to our victory. Valuable is the information he has brought to me for he has dwelt in ten towns for two winters and more. Then what role does he play? Hiefstag pressed. He is informed, Bjorg reiterated. That is past, said Hiefstag. What value is he to us now? Certainly he cannot fight beside warriors such as ours. Bjorg cast a glance at de Bernazan, biting back his own contempt for the dog who had betrayed his people in a pitiful attempt to fill his own pockets. Plead your case, southerner. And may Tempest find a place in his field for your bones. De Bernazan tried futilely to match the iron gaze of Hiefstag. He cleared his throat and spoke as loudly and confidently as he could. When the towns are conquered and their wealth secured, you shall need one who knows the southern marketplace. I am that man. At what price? growled Hiefstag. A comfortable living, answered De Bernazan. A respected position, nothing more. Bah! snorted Hiefstag. He would betray his own. He would betray us. The giant king tore the axe from his belt and lurched at de Bernazan. Bjorg grimaced, knowing that this critical moment could defeat the entire plan. With his mangled hand, Hiefstag grabbed de Bernazan oily black hair and pulled the smaller man's head to the side, exposing the flesh of his neck. He swung his axe mightily at the target. His gaze locked onto the southerner's face. But even against the unbending rules of tradition, Bjorg had rehearsed de Bernazan well for this moment. The little man had been warned in no uncertain terms that if he struggled at all, he would die in any case. But if he accepted the stroke and Hiefstag was merely testing him, his life would probably be spared. 
mustering all of his willpower. De Bernazon steeled his gaze on Hiefstog and did not flinch at the approach of death. At the very last moment, Hiefstog diverted the axe, its blade whistling within a hair's breadth of the southerner's throat. Hiefstog released the man from his grasp, but he continued to hold him in the intense lock of his single eye. An honest man accepts all judgments of his chosen kings, de Bernazon declared, trying to keep his voice as steady as possible. A cheer erupted from every mouth in Hangarot, and when it died away, Hiefstog turned to face Bjorg. Who shall lead? the giant asked bluntly. Who won the challenge of the song? Bjorg answered. Well settled, good king, Hiefstog saluted his rival. Together then, you and I, and let no man dispute our rule. Bjorg nodded. Death to any who dare! De Bernazon sighed in deep relief and shifted his leg defensively. If Hiefstog, or even Bjorg, ever noticed the puddle between his feet, his life would certainly be forfeit. He shifted his legs again nervously and glanced around, horrified when he met the gaze of the young standard bearer. Bernazon's face blanched white in anticipation of his coming humiliation and death. The standard bearer unexpectedly turned away and smiled in amusement, but in an unprecedented merciful act for his rough people, he said nothing. Hiefstog threw his arms above his head and raised his gaze and axe to the ceiling. Bjorg grabbed his axe from his belt and quickly mimicked the movement. Tempos! They shouted in unison, then eyeing each other once more, they gashed their shield arms with their axes, wetting the blades with their own blood. In a synchronous movement, they spun and heaved the weapons across the hall, each axe finding its mark in the same keg of mead. Immediately, the closest men grabbed flagons and scrambled to catch the first drops of spilling mead that had been blessed with the blood of their kings. I have drawn a plan for your approval, Bjork told Hiefstag. Later, noble friend, the one-eyed king replied. Let tonight be the time of song and drink to celebrate our coming victory. He clapped Bjorg on the shoulder and winked with his one eye. Be glad of my arrival, for you were sorely unprepared for such a gathering, he said with a hearty laugh. Bjorg eyed him curiously, but Hiefstag gave him a second grotesque wink to quench his suspicions. Abruptly, the lusty giant snapped his fingers at one of his field lieutenants, nudging his rival with his elbow, as if to let in on the joke. Fetch the wenches, he commanded. Thanks for tuning in to Chapter 3 of The Crystal Shard from the Icewind Dale Trilogy by Ari Salvatore. I hope you enjoyed our time in the Mead Hall and the intriguing events that took place there. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to extend a special thank you to my incredible Patreon supporters. Just so you know, your support is what keeps this channel going and allows me to share these amazing stories with you all. If you're interested in joining our Patreon community and accessing exclusive content, you'll find the link in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Your support helps the channel grow and reach more book enthusiasts like you. Also, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this chapter. Drop a comment down below and let me know what you think about the happenings in the Mead Hall. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Happy reading.